Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Welcome in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. is in our confession where we realize our desire for God and uh, our hope for God's mercy. It is in admitting the truth of our lives that we take the first step toward wholeness and healing. So let us make our confession first in silent prayer. God of all saint, all the saints, God of all the sinners, hear our prayer. We would be saint-like, holy, good, patient, loving, but we end up feeling more like sinners, full of failures of morality, selfish, mean. Perhaps you see us simply human as beloved and flawed and trying and failing and seceding. In all of this, forgive the wrong that we have done and bless the good we have accomplished. Keep on loving us and helping us and molding us more and more into the image of Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. Friends, hear this good news. The love of God is beyond measure and you are included in that love. Know that you are forgiven and thus freed to live and love and serve because Christ is risen. He is, he is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Amen. Amen.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. again from the dead, our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep. By the blood of your eternal covenant, make us complete in everything good that we may do your will and work among us all that is well-pleasing in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The reading for today is from the seventh chapter of Revelation, beginning at verse 9. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and they were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the lamb. The Psalm today is Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. The Lord makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want, he makes me down to lie. In the pastures green, he leadeth me, the quiet waters high. He leadeth me, he leadeth me, the quiet You restore my soul, O Lord, and guide me along right pathways for your name's sake. My soul he doth restore again and make to walk doth make within the paths of righteousness in for his own name's sake. Within the of righteousness in for his own sake. 
Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, and my cup is running over. My table which is spread in the presence of my foes. My head thou hast with oil anoint, and my cup overflows. My head thou dost with oil anoint, and my cup Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Goodness and mercy all my life shall surely follow me, and in God's house The second lesson is from the book of Acts, beginning at the 36th verse. Now, in Joppa, there was a disciple whose name was Tabitha, which in Greek is Dorcas. She was devoted to good works and acts of charity. At that time, she became ill and died. When they had washed her, they laid her in a room upstairs. Since Lydia was near Joppa, the disciples who heard that Peter was there sent two men to him with the request, please come to us without delay. So Peter got up and went with them. And when he arrived, they took him to the room upstairs. All the, window, all the widows stood beside him weeping and showing tunics and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was with them. Peter put all of them outside, and then he knelt down and prayed. He turned to the body and said, Tabitha, get up. Then she opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. He gave her his hand and helped her up. Then calling the saints and widows, he showed her to be alive. This became known throughout Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. Meanwhile, he stayed in Joppa for some time with a certain Simon, a tanner. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Gospel according to John. Lord, to you, o Lord. At that time, the festival of the dedication, now known as Hanukkah, took place in Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was walking in the temper in the portico of Solomon. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, 
How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Jesus answered, I have told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name testify to me, but you do not believe, because you do not belong to my sheep. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. What my Father has given me is greater than all else, and no one can snatch it out of the Father's hand. The Father and I are one. The Gospel of the Lord. Alleluia. readings today present us two different metaphors, two different images describing Jesus, the lamb and the shepherd. Those two images are related, but they are very different in concept and function. One leads, the other follows. How can Jesus be both? Well, let's take a look at each aspect of, of Jesus. In our reading from Revelations, we see Christ depicted as the Lamb. We are told of a great multitude standing before the throne of God and the Lamb. Their robes have been washed in the blood of the Lamb, but they have not been stained red. They've been washed clean and white, as if all sin was washed away. That is one aspect of Jesus we should know well. After all, we just finished 40 days of Lent and Easter, celebrating his death and resurrection. This was the sacrifice that was needed to give us the promise of eternal life. Jesus Christ came down from the Father and became a sheep in order to understand us. He lived the life of a sheep to experience life as we know it, our joy, our triumphs, our pain, our sorrow. And he died like a sheep to give us eternal life, to save us. So why is it in our gospel today that when asked, Jesus describes himself as a shepherd, not a lamb. John tells us that Jesus is at the temple complex during Hanukkah. Some Jews gather around him and ask Jesus to put an end to all the debate concerning his identity once and for all. How long will you keep us in suspense, they say. If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Spit it out, buddy. Come on, tell us the skinny. What's going on? Who are you? The problem, of course, is that regardless of what Jesus says or does, the debate does not seem to end. Jesus responds that he has already told them and that the works he has done in his father's name testify to him but they do not believe because they do not belong to his flock. Those who belong to Jesus, who hear and recognize his voice and follow him have been given to him by the Father. Everything depends on God's initiative. God sent his son to the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. Many people in our communities experience doubt. They doubt their abilities to overcome difficult situations. They doubt if they will make it through without succumbing to an old addiction. They doubt their friends or parents are aware of how much pain they are in. And they doubt God's presence in their lives and their connection to God. Doubt and questioning 
our normal parts of our lives as people and as persons of faith. When we acknowledge that reality, we give permission for people of faith to admit their doubt and make it normative. And we empower folks to claim their own journeys. So often in church, we talk about faith and that's a powerful thing to talk about. But to not claim the flip side of faith, the perpetual traveling companion of faith, doubt, means we are not leaving room for the real life experiences of people. Even the most faithful have doubts. Have you heard the saying, God never gives us more than we can handle. I just wish God didn't have so much faith in me. <laughs> it's a common saying, and uh, for me, it expresses the doubt we feel in handling things all on our own. But we are not alone in our journey. Jesus is saying much the same thing. He is telling us and the doubters that he is one with God, that he knows his followers, and that they know him. He is continuing a strand of teaching from earlier in the chapter. He is following the same vivid image of sheep to describe his followers from the Good Shepherd passage. And he is declaring that he knows all who follow him, and they know him for who he is. Jesus is also alluding to Psalm 23. Those who are part of his flock will be protected through the valley of the shadow of death. They will be led to still waters and green pastures for rest and food. Again, we hear an allusion to a thief coming to steal the sheep of Jesus' flock but his followers are protected by one who is more powerful than any thief coming to do them harm. There are two marks of being part of Jesus' flock, hearing his voice and following him. The folks who are once again pestering him about his identity have not heard him. They are not part of his flock. Like many of you, I am struck by the increasing divisions in our society from the way social media can be used to divide and conquer with the goal of profit and power to the way we develop and build neighborhoods to politics, workplaces, public health, education, race, class, gender, sexuality, and even divisions within our denominations and congregations. There are so many factions in our modern life. Unfortunately, there are many individuals out there who are leading us in the wrong direction. Many of whom claim to speak for God. Those voices are everywhere but we do not always recognize how contrary they are to the voice of the Good Shepherd. For instance, there are many voices that tell us how to grow closer by God, by having a prescribed religious experience, by believing the correct doctrine, by reaching a higher level of knowledge or a higher level of morality. By contrast, the Good Shepherd tells us that everything depends on belonging to him. Never does our status before God depend on how we feel, on having the right experience, of being free of doubt, or on what we accomplish. It depends on one thing only, that we are known by the shepherd. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life 
and they will never perish. My sheep hear my voice. The voice is a good of the good shepherd is a voice that liberates rather than oppresses. It does not say, do this, and then maybe you will be good enough to be one of my sheep. It says, you belong to me already. No one can snatch you out of my hand. Secure in this belonging, we are free to live the abundant life of which Jesus spoke earlier in the chapter. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. The abundant life of which Jesus speaks is not necessarily about abundance in years or in wealth or status or accomplishments. It is life that is abundant in the love of God made known in Jesus Christ. Love that overflows to others. It is eternal life because its source is in God, who is eternal, and in Jesus, who is the resurrection and the life. Amidst all the other voices that evoke fear, that make demands or give advice, the voice of the good shepherd is a voice of promise, a voice that calls us by name and claims us as God's own. John understands that the empire has its own mode of social formation, its own vision of community. This sense of community in the empire comes by way of us versus them. Empire needs concepts of borders and boundaries to exist, and it needs to continue to reinforce them at every step of the way. If you want what is good about the empire, you must comply. If you do not comply, you will be removed. In contrast, the multitude in Revelations is countless and made up of every nation, all tribes, all people, all languages. This tells us that the vision is that the community formed around the Lamb is not formed by borders, nation states, militaries, ethnicities, or any other human category or distinction we put on others. The binding feature of this community is that the people stand before the lamb, robed in white, holding palm branches, living in peace. The religion of the Lamb is a community that has no need for us versus them. The multitude is not formed by antagonism, it is formed out of the freedom that comes from sacrificial love, nonviolence, and patient endurance. The image of the multitude subverts the subdivisions of humanity. The multitude is a vision of all and holds out the possibility of a way of being community that does not need to be over and against others in order to exist. So how do we do this? How do we live this vision and help others to live it too? We do it by being aware of what is going on in our own communities. The struggles of those living in those communities and being true to that reality in our actions. We do it by providing a way out of the lostness, by providing again, or maybe for the first time, a chance to be invited into a relationship with God. We do this by reminding our people of the gifts unmerited that God gives us of grace and forgiveness. We do that by once again bringing our people to the font and the gifts to remember the gift of, of grace at baptism and to the table 
to remember the abundant hope we receive from the body and blood of Christ shared in the sacrifice. We join with the Lamb by listening to the trusted voice of the shepherd. Amen. Please join me in professing our faith with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Set free from cap captivity to sin and death, we pray to the God of resurrection for the church people in need, and all of creation. Gentle shepherd, enable your church to respond to the voice of Jesus. 
Give us all, give us unfailing trust, unafraid to join in Jesus' work for renewing all things. Feed your people at the table of creation. Prepare a safe place for those whose environments are dangerous or unhealthy, especially those making difficult journeys. Prosper your creation for the sake of every living thing. Warm the hearts of all who celebrate and all who mourn on Mother's Day. Accompany those yearning to be mothers. Help us to heal from broken family relationships and open us to receive your nurturing love from all who serve mothering roles in our lives. Seek out those who weep while they await healing or consolation. Set people in their path who can provide the care they need and wipe away every tear from their eyes. Inspire the words of prophets and saints who employ innovative imagery to stretch our understanding. Send Christ to instruct us with motherly care. Enfold us in the great multitude of saints from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages. Wash us in your saving grace every day, guiding us to your waters of life. Now, for who else and what else do the people of Christ the King pray? In your mercy, O God, respond to these prayers and renew us by your life-giving spirit. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. Jesus called God his Father, so do we. Please pray the language and translation of your heart. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The peace be with you. And also with you. Please extend a sign of peace to the people around you. Thank you. 
And now we say our thanks for all the offerings of talent, time, possessions, everything you give to us so that we can move forward. I looked up how to say this, and I think it's hub chai, if I'm not mistaken. So God can turn our little gifts into great blessings. Let us pray. God, you came to us. You brought joy to the earth. Feed us at your table that we may proclaim your peace and love shown in Jesus Christ. Amen. You are beloved by God, welcomed with open arms, and strengthened for the journey of the risen Christ, by the risen Christ. Bless you today and always. Give us a moment to uh, get ready for our sending song, Let It Be. Unlike a lot of folks that, that don't know the story behind this song, it was written by Paul McCartney for his mother, uh, who had passed away when he was a young teenager, around 14 or 15 years old. So it's not about the Virgin Mother of Christ, but he's okay with interpreting that way. And the upshot of this song is, of course, that today is Mother's Day, and we are celebrating all mothers, all those who want to be mothers, all those who had a mother, which I think includes everybody here. So yeah, hope you enjoyed the song. Myself in times of trouble, Mother Mary comes to me, speaking words of wisdom, let it be. And in my hour of darkness, she is standing right in front of me, speaking words of wisdom, let it be.
Christ is risen. He is risen Go in peace, serve the Lord.